Hello, everyone, and welcome. I would like to begin by saying we are gathered on the homeland of the Wampanoag people. The Wampanoag tribe, also known as the people of the first light, has inhabited this land for more than 12,000 years. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wampanoag community, their past, present, and future generations. Thank you and welcome to all of you. Welcome to our virtual event, Forest on Cape Cod, Past, Present, and Future, happening in conjunction with our ongoing exhibit, The Greenhouse, by Ethan Morrow. In this panel, we will hear from a range of voices as we explore the forest, trees, and ecosystems of Cape Cod, their past, present, and future. Ethan Morrow's exhibition, The Greenhouse, includes a 75 foot long wall drawing of an oak tree, has been an incredibly important exhibit for us here at the Cahoon Museum, and has elicited a wide range of questions from our visitors about the history and future of our local ecosystems. If you haven't seen this exhibit in person, we would love to, for you to see it at the Cahoon and get there quickly. The show ends on October 3rd. Ethan would never claim to be an expert in uh, the subject, but rather a curious observer looking at the stories emerging from the world we live in. And I'm genuinely excited for our panel tonight. Our guest tonight will share unique and interesting insights into our local trees, forests, and ecosystems. Let me begin by introducing Ramona Peters of the Native Land Conservancy, Kelly Barber of the Barnstable Land Trust, Dr. Tara K. Ranimi from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and artist Ethan Murrow, who thanks to his and his team's amazing work on the greenhouse exhibit, inspired us to have this panel tonight. So for those of you who are new to Zoom, there's a little button that says chat at the bottom of your screen. And if you can please help me welcome our panelists by saying hello and letting us know where you're watching from. This is also where you can direct questions you may have for the panel throughout their presentations. And after everybody has a chance to speak, we will answer all of your questions at the end of their discussion. Thank you. And now I'd like to allow everyone to uh, say where you're watching from and um, say hello to welcome our guests tonight. Centerville, North Falmouth, Clinton, Mass, Born, Pituit, Sandwich. Looks like we have the kid. Oh, we have someone from Pennsylvania watching in. Really exciting. Boston, fantastic. So I would like to start off with Ethan Murrow, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the idea for the show came together and how it came to be. Thank you, Michael. And um, I'm so honored that all of you decided to come this evening. Um, I'm especially grateful to the other panelists for um, taking some time out of their day to join this discussion too. It's a huge honor for me to be here with um, the three of you and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. As, as Michael said before, I'm, I'm not an expert um, on the Cape. I'm not an expert on trees. I'm, uh, I'm not an ecologist. I'm not a historian, but I am um, someone who grew up on a small farm in rural Vermont on a sheep farm. And I found a huge amount of solace, um, as a, especially as a teenager, um, in the woods um, and particularly among trees. I, I found that the forest gave me a kind of a sense of peace and stability and confidence that I wasn't maybe finding in the social world that I was encountering as a young person. Um, and I also grew up in a family where we, um, we logged and we cut um, timber to heat our house. Um, we built our own home. So wood and wood products and the life cycle of plants were very important to the way in which I understood the world and understood shelter and um, how things were happening around me. Um, I also um, was fascinated as a kid by, um, as most young people are, by the first time I saw tree cores or saw the, the rings of a tree and the way in which um, a tree uh, so clearly represents um, a kind of a signal to, to humans to be humble um, about how short our time is here on earth and how there are all these other facets of the earth that are uh, living and breathing around us that are um, often much older um, 
maybe more patient and knowing um, than we are. And so the drawing, the wall drawing and the piece at the Cahoon kind of comes out of some of these childhood experiences um, and is really meant to be a love letter to trees in many ways. Um, I think for most of us, we uh, have to face the fact that we are, are we're living in a crumbling environment in many ways. And um, we certainly have to find uh, better and more important ways to collaborate with nature. And so the drawing is a panoramic piece of a, of a tree, as Michael said, a dead oak, an oak that has fallen, but it's also um, it has small plants on top of it, little flowers and mosses and things that are growing um, and starting a process of rebirth. So it's what we might call a, a nurse tree or, and maybe the other panelists can correct me here, but that would be how I would think about it. This is a tree that's supporting new growth and new life. And so it's meant to be, um, this image is meant to be a, um, a discussion of the fact that um, it, in, in the forest, nothing is ever really dead, that it's, it's always um, uh, kind of building a connection to perhaps the next life form, or at least that would be um, the hope. And so um, this kind of idea of the cycle of life forms um, in the forest is a big part of the drawing. There are also aspects of human intervention. Um, it's implied that perhaps humans cut the tree down. There's also a tree house at the top of the tree, um, which may have perhaps caused the tree to fall. Um, and then there are little aspects within the drawing that suggest that humans are perhaps trying to prop up the tree or support it as if they're trying to maybe help it um, continue to grow or survive. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do is maybe raise questions about how we work with a life form like a tree, um, how we can um, try and find some sort of partnership um, with natural forms. Um, it's not something I see us doing a very good job at. And so I'm eager for, um, for these kinds of discussions to be really present in the work. And very much this, this project grows out of some of the experiences that I think all of us have been having recently um, with all of the health realities that are going on. Um, I found that during COVID, my um, affection for plants and my understanding of the importance of plants around me was revitalized. Um, and I spent a lot of time in my garden and um, feeling very thankful to have space to even grow some small, very small plants um, around me. And so when I came back into the studio and came back with this amazing chance that the Cahoon gave me to build this massive drawing, I wanted to find a way to talk about um, my affection for plants and my belief that they, um, they may offer a way forward for us. And then finally, I also, you know, what was really important to me about building a piece for the Cahoon was thinking about uh, an image that would talk about history, um, the history of the site, um, the history of the place of the museum um, without me um, speaking um, for uh, what may have happened there, because I don't know what's happened on this land. And I, um, I can make some assumptions. I know that there's been a lot of violence and change and theft and um, birth and rebirth and changes, um, economic, political, political, cultural, et cetera. So many different um, peaks and valleys that may have occurred just in this one place. But I don't know those things necessarily. And yet I do know that the trees around um, uh, us uh, certainly do know some of that. So I was trying to find a way to talk about history without um, um, speaking for um, the maybe the places and spaces that I, I maybe don't feel like I have um, the right to speak for um, or the knowledge to speak for. And so I really love the fact that trees um, are usually older than we are and usually have seen more than we have. Um, I, I, I can't help but um, kind of think about them as having voices and kind of rolling their eyes at the idiocies of um, human actions and behavior. Um, so I do think about the tree as a, as a kind of speaking form um, and it's meant to be a character on the wall in the museum. So those are some of the things that were really important. I just wanna 
say at the end too, that this was a drawing that I made, as Michael said, with a team, three incredible other um, artists who came in to help me. And of course, the whole staff at the Cahoon were, who were amazing um, in terms of supporting our work. So I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to do it. Um, and um, I recognize some um, names and people here on this call. Um, and uh, many of you I know have seen the piece. So thank you for your support of it um, by attending and um, coming tonight too. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was uh, really wonderful to hear about you, uh, from you about your thoughts and the growing thoughts on the exhibit itself. Uh, Ramona, I would love to hear from you next. All right. Renee Khan, Natasha Ruiz Nosepake, Natal Masiki. My other name is Nosepake, and I'm from Mashpee just bordering uh, it, And I'm a member of the National Wampanoag tribe. And we have, um, we have a long history with the area, of course, over 12,000 years, it's been proven by artifacts, etc. And during that time, um, of course, as Ian was mentioning, a lot has happened. But before I start speaking about that, um, I want to say that I really appreciate this piece um, that's now inhabiting the museum. Uh, it's um, I love the choice of the oak um, as one of the many trees that could be chosen. Yeah, it's very, very uh, meaningful to me on a number of levels. I'm, I'm holding a little piece of oak at this moment. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna try and put it near the camera to see, and I'm not sure if the writing is backwards. It looks backwards to me, but maybe it's not to you. Um, great. So this little piece of wood is a, um, some of you may have guessed already, it's a little broken because it was removed from the old Indian meeting house that is just down the street from the Cajun Museum on route, off of Route 28. Now, the old Indian meeting house was built in 1684. Um, when you say built it, I think it took a lot of time for it to actually be constructed, but um, that building has seen a lot and um, Sometimes it's open to the public for neighbors, anyone who might want to take a peek. This, we remodeled or renovated this building about 15 years ago. And in the process of doing that, the, uh, the company that we hired um, wanted to salvage all of the wood possible in this building. Most of it was in good shape, but some of it was not. Um, now it's been modernized with electricity and air conditioning and heating. We can use it year round and we really need it as a tribal group for weddings and funerals, et cetera. This building has a lot of history to it. And there's um, some graffiti in there from back in the 19th century. It's a lot of um, ship carvings and in the walls and in the pews, some of the sailing that was going on back then. Um, a lot of our people, our men were involved in the whaling industry. Um, so when we remodeled, uh, the company did some testing on the wood. And there is a um, upright, um, I wanna say, well, it's a, um, a beam. It's a full oak beam, quite wide, um, reaches to the ceiling and beyond to the rafters. And it actually came from England. They did a cellular test on this wood and found that this particular, and we don't know how many others, but we know that at least one of them was brought over by boat. Now, so 
this is really crazy for me to imagine because I know that Cape Cod, it was pretty much clear cut. Um, by the 1820s, we were almost bare on Cape Cod, with the exception of Mashpee. Now, at that time, the tribe was under an overseer rulership. Um, it was like a reservation, but they called it plantation in those days. So the Indian plantation existed for some 200 years before we became a town. Um, but before we, came, before we came a town, we had a brief moment where we proclaimed um, self-rule. And we also made a proclamation to the state and our neighbors that we would no, not allow white people to come onto the plantation and cut and cart away wood. So we were very obviously, if you looked on the landscape of Cape Cod and you saw everything was clear cut except for this one 22,000 acres of old growth forest um, with a tall canopy, we had a different existence here. The overseer at the time was um, tempted and started to sell off little pieces of, uh, for wood. Um, and so we got upset about that and that's why we proclaimed this, um, this proclamation. And it was in May of 1833 that it was announced that come July 1st that year, we would not allow any more cutting or carting away of the trees. Well, fellow from Katua decided to test this one week after the 1st of July to test this, uh, our resolve on the matter. So he came on uh, onto the plantation and got a wagon load of wood. And before he could leave, he was approached by, I want to say seven, seven uh, Wampanoag men. And they unloaded the wagon and sent him on his way. Wasn't long after that, that those men, those natives men were then arrested for riot, um, assault and trespass. They were charged with those three things and put in jail. That was the uh, famous Mashpee Wood Riot. They called it a riot. And uh, so in this short story, just to give you an idea of some of the historic and cultural landscape, I have one more story I would like to just add to this mix. Um, one of my elder cousins, uh, Vernon Bachnett, we, we used to sit around and talk a lot and, and he tells stories where he tells some good stories. But he told me once about how his family, and we all used wood. I mean, everybody used wood for um, heating and cooking, building, you know, it, it's, it's given us so, so much to the human family. But one particular log that he, said that was when it was put in the fire in the homestead, a song came out, a complete and perfect song from our ancestors. Uh, I'm not gonna sing it, but he sang it to me. And uh, I, I just thought, wow, <laughs> what, a, what a very special gift. Uh, and they just keep on giving, don't they? <laughs> So um, thank you for this moment to, to share. Thank you so much, Ramona. I feel, I'm sure everybody feels the same way that I'm incredibly honored that you shared those stories with us. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Tara, would you like to speak next? Sure. If I can manage to do that, I'm gonna to try to share my screen because typical college professor, I can't talk without slides. 
I'm going to see Perfect. if this works. It says I'm sharing my screen. Now will it let me go to the screen that I want to share is the question. Here we are. So I'm going to step away from the forest for a minute and then come back to it and talk about some of the work that I have done on coastal dunes at Wakoyat Bay, um, which is just outside Mashpee or partially in Mashpee. Um, and then get back to lengthen that to how I think it's related to forest on Cape Cod. So background, um, I my degree is in plant ecology. So I study how plants interact with each other and with their environment and how those interactions determine which species you have in which places and which species are dominant, which are rare, um, how many species you have. And I um, did my PhD and my postdoc all in the Midwest working in grasslands like this one. Um, these are the same everywhere. This is actually a picture from UMass Dartmouth. And I focused a lot on roots of those plants and understanding how um, roots interact. So in, uh, I'm just gonna leave those up. Um, in 2005, 2004, I came here to UMass Dartmouth and I've continued to work on the grasslands and the roots, but I also wanted to work on a system that maybe had some more local interests, some real importance um, other than the, the weeds that I usually work with. So I started working at Wakoya Bay on that little spit of land all the way to the right. There's a barrier dune system and just off the picture farther to the right, you'd be on South Cape Beach. Um, and the pattern in the plants that's really interesting to me is there's this very strong zonation. Of course, if you start at the beach facing the ocean and then walk back to the bay, um, certain plants you only find in certain places. So if you start at the beach, um, above the, the general high tide line, the only thing you find out there is this little plant called sea rocket. Um, and then farther back, you've got an area of, of beach grass, which has a very extensive root system. It holds the soil together and starts building up the sand that creates the dune. And there are only a few species that are scattered in. Among there, I get a picture of a beach pea up there. There's some goldenrod, there's some evening primrose. And these things are all very tolerant of wind, of salt spray from the ocean, of dry conditions because the sand doesn't hold water very well. Um, if you get up onto the top of the dune, which in this area, the dunes aren't very high, but on the, the crest of the dune and just behind, where there's a little more protection from the wind, you get aerial shrubs. It's mostly salt spray rose there in the middle. There's a, almost a continuous band of that. And then further back, more shrubs like beach plums. There's a lot of poison ivy, which also looks shrubby. Um, and this thing on the right, this ugly little plant called wormwood, which tends to specialize in the areas where the wind's blowing away the other vegetation. And then further back, there's another band of um, bayberry shrubs and then you come to the bay and in some places there's a, another little stretch of dune um, on the bay side. So in talking with Michael about this um, exhibit and we had talked about the idea that Cape Cod used to be covered with old growth forests and I started thinking about how does the this dune system relate to a, a past when there was a forest and um, it's got, well, this is my, let me skip that. It's got me thinking about one of the very first scientific papers in the field of ecology, plant ecology, was this one um, by Henry Chandler Cowles, the guy on the horse. This was published in Botanical Gazette in 1899. And it was a study of this very same question of how the, um, environment shaped the sand dunes on Lake Michigan. And so the way he describes the, the dunes there is that if you start at the shore, you've got this beach area, um, which has 
again, the same species, it has sea rocket growing um, right there close to the beach. And then an area where they've got dune stabilizers. He names a couple of grasses, but the main one is a very closely related species to the grass we have here. Um, he also talks about the plants that grow in among the grasses, which are exactly the same ones we have here. Um, and then beyond that area where there's a little, the grasses have built up the sand, there's a little more protection from the wind. He gets a shrub layer like we've got. His are sand cherry mostly instead of the rose, but they're again in the same family. But what happens in Lake Michigan over time is that winds continue to blow sand up over these plants. The grasses continue to accumulate sand in their roots. The dunes get higher and higher until finally at the top, it's so hot and dry and wind blown that the plants actually die off. And then you get a, a section called the wandering dunes where the, the sand is blowing again. And eventually in some places you'll get some protection from the wind on the leeward side of those dunes and get some shrubs that start to grow up the back. And those shrubs over time drop their leaves that decay and build up a soil that trees start to um, revegetate. So eventually over time, as you get farther and farther from the beach, you end up with a forest. So my speculation is that the same thing may have happened on Cape Cod as well, that maybe we don't see it anymore because, or we don't see this whole process happening anymore because the, you get a certain distance away from the, the shore and well, in the, sex, the area I'm working in, you got a bay, but we've got, um, we've got development. And so there's not a big wandering dune area where those trees can get established again, but this may be how you built up a forest back before there was European colonization in the, in the clear cutting. And it really struck me thinking about this that the species that I've been looking at, and I've been really looking at how do they tolerate salt spray and wind and temperature and sun, and all of those things seem to be important in determining what species are where, but over a hundred years ago, Henry Cowles is seeing the same thing in Lake Michigan where there is no salt spray. And one interesting tidbit is that there's this one, that weird little species called wormwood that I said only showed up farther back where the, the vegetation was blown away. In his case, he finds it everywhere, all the way almost up to the beach. And it's been sort of a mystery to us that you get wormwood seeds all the way up to the beach and rarely see it growing. And when it does grow, it doesn't last very long. And our test has shown that it is very intolerant of salt. And the, I guess the exception that proves the rule that it's not just salt spray that, that drives these things like I thought it was. Um, but the, that is my slides. Let me see if I can go back and stop sharing. So there's my story. <laughs> Thank you. That was really, really fascinating. And um, I uh, think I see now, I, I actually got to name one of these plants that's in one of the paintings behind me. So, um, so thank you so very much. Uh, next up, we will hear from Kelly. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, I'm really enjoying being a part of this panel. Um, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to experience Ethan's piece in person a few weeks ago. Uh, so I wanted to share some comments about our organization, Barnesville Land Trust, and then uh, tie it back to Ethan's piece and have some comments on uh, Oaks in particular. So for those of you that might not be familiar with us, um, Barnesville Land Trust is a community supported nonprofit organization. 
and our mission is to preserve the natural resources and special places in the town of Barnstable and nearby areas, uh, working with our partners in Sandwich, Mashpee, and Yarmouth when land protection opportunities bridge the town border. Uh, we've, in our almost 40 years as an organization, we've been able to protect over 1,100 acres that we steward ourselves and we've supported the town and other organizations uh, to protect an, addition, an additional 11,000 acres. Um, so in my role as the Director of Land Stewardship, uh, I work to incorporate and continue to incorporate up-to-date findings and research to best manage our protected lands. Um, for example, we have some locations that might be more appropriate to have trails for outdoor recreation uh, based on their size or the habitat that they have that might be more conducive for that. Um, but we have other parcels that may be smaller or maybe mostly wetlands uh, or protecting rivers and those really benefit um, from providing like 100 to 200 foot buffer as best as possible. Um, to better support those habitats and the wildlife protected in them and uh, reduce the impacts from stormwater runoff and other issues. Um, so for stewarding these lands, we host at the moment weekly volunteer stewardship projects to take care of our protected spaces and trails. And a lot of our projects focus on supporting our natural resources on site. Um, typically in the form of uh, invasive plant suppression, which are uh, foreign plants that have taken over a lot of areas and really fragment our natural ecosystems. Um, but we also do uh, direct uh, native plant support in the form of planting or seeding in areas to give our natives a fighting chance and help compete with these invasive plants. Um, and our overall goal for these projects are uh, to make our protected lands the best that they can be, to best support native plant and wildlife communities and grow community appreciation for them. So uh, in connecting with Ethan's piece, um, I wanted to thank Ethan and your team for uh, the research that you put into it um, and the message that you gave and sharing it with our community. Um, showing the supports along the way for how uh, humans are trying to correct our wrongs of the past or even into the future um, was a helpful message to see. Uh, I also like the piece of utilizing reclaimed wood, which is a great practice to support the life of our forests instead of starting with new wood. Um, and then the signs of hope at the end, looking through the window and the new oak seedling to uh, but what really resonated with me is what you shared about the nurse tree. Um, so I get a lot of uh, questions and, and ask frequently um, to, uh, quote, clean up our properties because we have um, dead wood, uh, dead standing trees, uh, dead fallen trees. And um, uh, but as your piece shows, uh, life does not end at tree death. A tree supports life throughout its life and beyond through its death. Um, they provide space, as you showed, for plants to take root, provide habitat for critters, birds, and insects that help to feed birds and other wildlife. And as they break down, they return nutrients back into the soil to continue to feed our forest. So they have a very, very important role in our ecosystem um, throughout their entire cycle through their death. So I really appreciate you sharing that message with us and sharing that with the community. Um, you might not consider yourself an expert, but I felt like you really uh, understood what's going on. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so I really love that you featured an oak in this piece. And so I wanted to share um, the importance about oaks in particular and what's kind of going on with them from um, at least my understanding from current research and findings. So, uh, so something I'm really passionate about is, um, is talking about uh, host plants and the importance of um, caterpillars. And oaks as a tree are a major host plant and they are in fact our top host plant in North America, if not the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so for those of you that might not know what that means, a uh, host plant means that butterflies and moths are dependent upon it to complete their life cycle as a caterpillar through adulthood. 
uh, they need that plant in order to feed on in order to complete that life cycle. So you might be familiar with monarch caterpillars and their dependence on milkweed as uh, they need milkweed available in order to feed on it, in order to pupate and become a butterfly and continue that cycle. So oaks are no different. And, uh, and with being a top host plant, um, they are a host to over 500 species of butterflies and moth caterpillars. Um, so that's really impactful and any threat to our oaks is um, a, a really a threat to our ecosystem as a whole. So why are caterpillars important? Why is this host plant to these 500 species plus important? 96% um, of our terrestrial birds rely on caterpillars to feed their young and that includes migratory birds as well. So they don't rely on seeds from your bird feeder um, and they don't rely on berries at that time. Uh, for the most part, they really need those caterpillars because they're high in protein and fat to really build baby birds. Um, so without an abundance of caterpillars in the ecosystem, that's really going to affect uh, the growth of our baby birds. Um, and, and we're seeing uh, with um, non-native species uh, fragmenting and uh, disrupting these native communities, uh, we are seeing a trend in, in bird death from uh, not having food available to them. Um, so with oaks supporting over 500 species of caterpillars, it's basically a big buffet for birds where they kind of know that an oak is one of the places that they can go to likely find food. Um, so that they're a big supporter uh, of our ecosystem and supporting them is really important. Um, so our oaks, along with a lot of trees in our forests are really struggling uh, with oaks being um, a host over 500 species of native caterpillars. Uh, they of course are attractive to some foreign invaders too. Um, many of us are familiar with gypsy moth and how they've just, especially a couple of years ago, really defoliated a lot of our oaks. Um, it almost looked like winter in a lot of parts on the Cape and in the region. And those are a foreign invader. Um, uh, oaks have co-evolved over uh, thousands of years with um, some native pests, uh, but those pests are pretty mild with them for the most part. And they've built up defenses to continue to live uh, even with that pressure. But with a foreign invader like gypsy moth, that isn't a really desirable treat for birds and doesn't really have much for natural predators. They go unchecked and that's why we've seen such a great impact on our oaks. Um, climate change is another issue. Uh, last year was a really bad drought year. And so that kind of sealed the deal with gypsy moth and even our, our native pests in combination with it. Um, to kill off a lot of our oak trees. Um, it does provide habitat for, for birds and other critters after, but we still need those living oaks to really support our caterpillars. Um, so I wanted to finish off with sharing uh, what you can do. So um, continuing to support your local land trusts um, and support conservation in general in your community will really help to protect our forests and protect our open spaces. Um, and thus protect uh, our fragile oaks and, and other trees. Um, if you have a yard at home, you can plant a native oak yourself. So um, I mean one that is native, uh, ideally to, to Cape Cod and the region, because that's really what's going to benefit uh, the caterpillars that are growing here because that's what they're adapted to. And oaks come in many different shapes and sizes. You, you could plant one that isn't gonna grow so tall in case that's something that you're concerned about. And uh, there are helpful resources for that for more information on oaks and just uh, supporting wildlife in general from your home. Um, Doug Tallamy, who's an entomologist, uh, recently published The Nature of Oaks, which is a great resource about oaks in general and covers um, a bit of the information that I covered here and focuses a lot on the caterpillars that it hosts. And Bringing Nature Home is a great resource as well for impactful host plants that you can incorporate into your, your yard, tree shrubs and um, wildflowers for pollinators. Um, so I highly recommend use, uh, 
using any of those books um, to learn more about this topic. So oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. As I bring our group back to the front. Any questions that anyone may have, please direct them to the chat and then we will get to your questions in order. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, really fascinating. And it's so interesting to hear how important a single plant can be in so many different ways in our ecosystem. And not only that we can appreciate them as human beings just by looking and being around them, but how much of everything else that we love and care for in our environment and ecosystem is really reliant just on a single oak tree. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, that they would like to um, uh, ask our group? Please pop them into the chat and um, we can uh, ask any questions that you may have. I did see a question up here. Uh, somebody did ask uh, if Ethan could talk about um, his feelings on the popularity of murals at the moment. Um, well, let me just begin by saying I, I loved hearing what the three of you had to say. Um, such, such different yet overlapping stories all at the same time um, and research and interest. So um, really amazing. And I, a, a really an honor for me to think about how that connects to the piece of the Cahoon. Um, I wanted to also just mention one thing and I will answer the question, but just of what you were saying, Kelly, about Oaks, and I neglected to mention earlier, is that the, the piece did come out of a um, research and, and understanding that you know the the oaks had been clear cut and were such an important part of the Cape. Um, and I think one 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 feeling I've always had about oaks is because they're so present um, across North America. I think sometimes they're taken for granted. Um, they're not a you know, a, a tree that's um, explicitly regional and obviously the different kinds of oaks are, but I think we kind of generically name them oak, you know, it's just this one big swath of tree. Um, and so I, I was also really interested to try and find a way to um, give a sometimes forgotten tree a, a center stage. So I, I appreciate um, your, all your tidbits of information is fascinating. Um, in terms of murals, um, I think, um, and Ramona, you talked about graffiti um, in the building. So I'm curious um, what that might be, but I think graffiti has a huge, huge um, kind of important history in terms of why murals have remained so vital in so many societies. I mean, it's across the world, you see people wanting to make images in public spaces, to say things in public spaces. And of course you have murals that are, you know, paid for and commissioned by cities and states and countries and things like that. I think the most vital and most interesting pieces in my mind are the pieces that come out of um, communities uh, spontaneously feeling like they, they have to say something and that a public wall is a very good place to do that. And so I think what I do um, while it's much more, you know, here we are, it's in a museum, it's sanctioned, it's, um, you know, a lot of deep work with the curatorial team and the museum to make sure this is the right thing. Um, it, I do want to really pay credit to the fact that um, the history of graffiti and, and protest and, um, and just general community uh, love of image making, which happens all, all over the place, excuse me, um, is a big part of why um, something like a mural remains um, quite vital to many communities. Um, and then I also think that um, there is uh, the, the history of maybe uh, artworks that come um, from other forms of craft, um, whether that is murals that happened in religious spaces 
around the world, whether that is cave paintings. These are made by people who um, really uh, thought long and hard about what they wanted to do and the stories they wanted to tell and felt it was important to tell those stories. So I think there, there's so many sort of avenues that come together to make wall drawings and murals um, continually an important thing. But to me, the most important factor is this idea of community storytelling and the fact that a, a public wall, especially, most especially, is a perfect place to tell a story about what might be happening in a community or what people might care about. So I think some of the most exciting murals come out of these projects where many, many artists and community members come together to form many, many different kinds of murals. I think those are really exciting. So you see, for example, in Miami, um, huge projects and hundreds and hundreds of murals happening. Um, and uh, those kinds of things are really great. So it's, it's fun to be have a small, tiny part in some of those kinds of things. So another question we have is, um, how can we support land conservation in Mashby with so much rapid development taking place? This is really open to the group. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, what, the Native Land Conservancy, which um, I'm, the founder, <clears throat> I'm the founder of this organization. We're nine years in um, so far. And there were there is no there was no uh, other land conservation group in Mashby. Uh, Arenda, who actually covers a larger area, um, has some holdings in Mashby as well as the trustees are now calling themselves the trustees or the trustees of reservations. Uh, Mashby is about. 40% conservation land, which is pretty good for uh, most towns. We have been resisting development. There's a lot of citizens here in Mashpee that are, are, are trying really hard to keep the sprawl from spreading any further. Um, the, the popularity of Cape Cod in itself is uh, Gone, gone off the charts, uh, especially recently with COVID. But uh, uh, I want to say that um, actually, I, I don't really want to go too far into what it means to. We actually have a visceral response to uh, bulldoze land. Um, tribal people, indigenous people, we still are connected to this land. It's in our DNA. Uh, we just totally feel it when it happens. And it upsets, it shifts our community in a lot of different ways. And we can only hold on to each other. Um, we don't have the power to prevent um, people from doing uh, what they do on lands that they have title to. Um, that's why I created the Native Land Conservancy as another way in which people could, when they think they're going to leave Mashby, um, or not just Mashby, uh, our, our conservancy covers a good part of southeastern Massachusetts and a little part of Rhode Island. Um, we, have, we have land uh, in trust in uh, four counties right now. But um, if anyone is thinking about leaving town and they would like to see um, the land conserved. I would hope that they would consider us um, to steward this land and we plan on being here into perpetuity as well. So um, that's where we are very, very happy to, to take care of this land for anyone who wishes to um, have it put in conservation. There are our friends. We also collaborate with other land trusts around Cape Cod. Um, we are especially interested in land that has uh, cultural significance to uh, indigenous people here. There are many sacred sites and special areas that have, uh, wow, there's so much um, that we have no longer have access to on Cape Cod that would be 
Um, we're trying, we have different tools. I hope you will visit our website because I don't want to take up too much time of this evening to talk about it, but there's a lot of things that we're doing to, um, we don't call it trying to prevent development as much as we call it trying to uh, rescue the land. And, and in many cases, it needs restoration. Um, I'm sure it's, uh, scientist scientific panel can attest to that. Ramona, uh, someone had a follow-up question, but um, it asked if you had advice about sustainability and land stewardship that incorporate indigenous perspectives. Would your website be a really good location for that? Um, sort of. Um, that's a big... Uh, there's a lot to that. Um, we, as far as restoring land, it's a concept and it's a new, it's a new and necessary activity, but it doesn't come, restoration doesn't come from our ancestral knowledge base as um, if, because we did not do these kinds of things to the land that are being done now and have been done for the past four centuries. So, it, you know, I know it might seem like, oh, sure, we know how to restore the land. Um, sometimes it, uh, we, we can only um, nurture it um, somewhat like a fallen oak tree um, or any other tree. To how do we restore its, um, its energy? And um, well, well I get, I'm trying not to go down those kind of terms. Um, we, do have we do have a method but it, it is all new because again, we, it does not come from how our ancestors used to restore clear cut land or bulldoze and compressed land or shifted soils or lopped off hillsides or you know, disrupted sand dunes. This is all, um, you know, it's all new. And so we're open to other ideas of how to do it. Um, we have friends in, with the um, Native Plant Trust and other places, um, some of the local universities in Boston and Cambridge, their students are helping us uh, focus on how to um, restore. And there's so many different techniques that we're looking at and listening to. Um, we do have a memory of how it used to be. Um, and what it used to feel like there, if, it, if I could dare say that. But um, so there is a connection in that regard, but um, the whole practice of restoration is something we all need to understand and begin to practice. Yeah. Thank you so much. To, oh, sorry. Oh, yes, um, Kelly. Yeah, I wanted to pitch in one more comment in addition to the um, how you can support land conservation in the town of Mashpee, but also beyond. Um, so in addition to supporting your uh, local land trusts and these nonprofit organizations like the Native Land Conservancy, talking to your town representatives to uh, encourage them to prioritize land conservation will help keep it top of mind for them um, and help to uh, support CPA funds uh, and other funds to uh, support land conservation projects. Thank you so much. Um, Barbara Park asks if um, anybody in the group is, knows anything about the old growth forests that still exist on the Elizabeth Islands. So I don't think we have any working knowledge of the old growth forests on the Elizabeth Islands. They, they have to just start uh, letting more people- The Elizabeth yeah. Islands are- mm -hmm. um, a private area where you, mm -hmm. you can't gain access to it. But we do know that some of the oldest plant species that ever existed here in this in this region um, actually has their, we're hoping and we wanted to get some seeds from there quite a while ago, but we were not allowed access. Um, it's a shame. But there are, Sad question. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear the question, but uh, yeah, that would be just a simple answer. No access. 
And then another question we have from the audience is ecologically, what is the state of Mashpee now? Uh, Mashpee's in trouble, um, especially with its water bodies. Uh, there has there have been a lot of well, you know, for a number of years we we are our entire board of selectmen were all developers. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine what happens to any town that has to a lot of that sort of interest. Um, and people like to live on the waterfront. Um, that wasn't a habit for native people. We never we, we live in a hurricane trail for goodness sakes. Um, you don't really want to be right there. Um, there, there has been some catastrophic things that have happened on the Cape. Um, when it was before, a few times before um, colonization. Um, and there's other times where we came very, very close. Um, but we, we are especially uh, thankful that uh, there haven't been anything. We have had tornado warnings a lot um, covering around certain areas and we're not sure what's attracting that. But Mashby is, we have um, contaminated bays and rivers and ponds. Um, two out of the three ponds are, are at an unacceptable level. Um, the septic systems and the uh, uh, I'm at a loss for the, um, the fertilizers that are being used. And also we had the military base had some plumes, toxic plumes of fuel oil, pesticides, and other things that have leached down and it sort of bedrock sort of comes down into Mashby. So we've had some problems there, but we, there was an EPA super fund that actually um, is considered successful. They were actually able to stop those plumes, pull them out and flush the, um, enough of the contaminants so that um, the land can thrive again in that vicinity of a um, John's Pond area. Where in, we really need to be uh, watching, watching very closely. Uh, people who plan on living in Mastery and staying there, um, take it from indigenous people. You really have to care for the land. When we were a plantation or reservation, it was a collective ecological movement. We took care of that land. And it, you have to, if you plan to stay there, you cannot pollute the water that you're going to drink or your children or your grandchildren. Um, it just seems yeah, we're in trouble, um, and I can only be candid about it uh, for this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much to our panelists and everyone who attended tonight. And also thank you to uh, Ethan Morrow and his exhibit, The Greenhouse, which is going on until October 3rd. Um, that really helped spawn this panel, which I have to say, I feel really uh, uh, amazed at everything I've heard tonight. I feel really excited about um, um, bringing these voices together tonight. Um, so, for everyone who's watching at home tonight, we would love to have you visit us at the Cahoon Museum. I really encourage everyone to come in and see this amazing exhibit before it's gone. Uh, we are open Wednesday through Sunday and are excited to see you down there at the Cahoon. If you enjoyed this panel, please check out our other panels, interviews, studio visits and more on our YouTube channel. And it would be a great help if you uh, hit that subscribe button when you're there. Um, you can also stay connected with us through the Kuhn Museum website, and I'll pop that link right into the chat for everybody right now. And 
Um, if you would like to support our work here at the museum, please consider making a donation or joining us as a member as we continue to bring new exhibitions and programming. Also earlier in the chat, I have placed all of the information for our panelists and speakers tonight. And I'll just pop that right back in there again. So if you're interested in reaching out to anyone that uh, you've heard from tonight, um, their uh, websites are in the chat at the moment. Um, thank you so much to our panelists tonight. And if uh, you could uh, say thank you in the chat as uh, we finish up for tonight. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>